All right, welcome everybody again to the Patriot Philosopher Podcast. My name is Dr. Michael Robillard, and today I am joined by three Catholic patriarchs of integrity and character who are collectively, uh, along with myself, uh, taking back Western civilization with this new idea, new movement that we're trying to start, uh, that we're tentatively referring to as Christian masculinism or Catholic masculinism. And uh, this is the third episode, and uh, it's rotating, so uh, I'm hosting today. And uh, for all you folks who are not uh, knowledgeable about these men, we'll go around the horn, and they can, uh, they can introduce themselves and explain who they are and a bit about what they're about. Uh, so, Will, uh, let's uh, start with you. Hey, Michael. Thanks for having me on. I was fired from Eton College in the UK, which is the leading all-boys school and has educated over 20 i think prime ministers and i was fired over a talk defending patriarchy as part of the debate course and this is about how what we think of as toxic masculinity now so aggression dominance stoicism competitiveness these are actually the very qualities that women have valued in men over the centuries and there's a really unhealthy emphasis on traditional masculinity being somehow oppressive, something we need to remove in contemporary culture. And the reason I'm here is that we're arguing that actually these are the things that the family in particular and culture more broadly depend on. Right. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Uh, Elliot, can you tell, uh, tell the audience a bit about yourself and your background? Sure. I am a strong man, strength coach, making men strong again. Uh, I've been on YouTube since 2007, so I've got quite a few million subscribers from my Strength Camp channel. But today, I'm focused here with you guys on bringing back traditional masculinity through Christ and the one holy and apostolic Catholic Church, bros. Excellent, excellent. And uh, Tim, can you give, uh, give the audience a bit of your, uh, bit of your background? What's up, guys? Glad to be back with you for the uh, Christian masculinism. I wrote the book, The Case for Patriarchy. My wife wrote the book called Ask Your Husband. I have three other books out, but my, my channel, Rules for Retrogrades, is all about restoring Catholic masculinity, which is moral. It's, it's virtue ethics centered. It's strong. It built Western civilization and it aims if enough men re-embrace it to restore Western civilization. So there is a case for patriarchy and, and the negative way of saying this is that there is no case for Western civilization without patriarchy. That's why it's so important that we're doing the work we're doing, the four of us, because Christian masculinism is not yet repopularized, even though there is this new right wing that's emerging so far, it doesn't really include Christian masculinism. And you, you see some of the red pill guys out there. I think today we'll be talking about Andrew Tate. They see masculinism as utterly foreign to Christianity, mm -hmm. whether we're talking Protestant or Catholic Christianity. And, and it's it's simply and straightforwardly not. So that's that's why I'm here. Right. Great. Great. So. Yeah, you mentioned a bit, Tim, is that, you know, today we're going to be talking uh, a bit more about Andrew Tate. We, we talked about him uh, in some of the last episodes, uh, mainly with respect to the, the red pill and, uh, you know, uh, pickup artist sort of space. Uh, and I'm sure, uh, you know, you guys agree with me. I, we don't want this to be an Andrew Tate podcast, but, you know, it, it is relevant in the news recently because I guess he... Uh, recently announced this week that he converted to Islam. And, uh, you know, so I'd like to center the conversation today uh, around this overlap between the manosphere, red pill and, and Islam and where the, the, the Catholic masculine voice uh, comes in to, to weigh in on all of this. Uh, so, so any, any initial thoughts on this, uh, this Tate announcement of, of converting to Islam? At least now he's a monotheist. I think even if it ends up with multiple wives, polygamy, <coughs> that's a big step up from promiscuity. So I now have more in common with Tate than I did before. 
Right. Yeah. Uh, you, you were, you've been particularly uh, vocal against him, Will, uh, and a, a lot of his his earlier uh, promiscuity uh, uh, rantings. Um, can you say a bit more about what you what you were critiquing him on? Yeah, I don't think he's got any ideas. He's not like a thinker, but mm -hmm. as a, a symptom of some of the problems with ideas about masculinity in the West today, he's a really good example of what's going wrong. Essentially, guys like Tate are the left's last laugh because they're doing the work that they wanted to be done during the sexual revolution for them. So if you accept the big thing of sex outside marriage, for example, you're contributing to a family breakdown and restructuring society along those lines. If you want to see how that ends up, look at the ghetto. That's taking that experiment further than anywhere else. And ultimately, it results in the removal of biological fathers from the home and increased dependence of women on the welfare state. And ironically, that emasculates men pretty much better than anything else because the mm -hmm. state steps in and takes that role that should be the male head of the household. So it's a tragedy, but it's also kind of a dark comedy as well. Right, right. Yeah, I, if I, I could kick this in, the formula seems to go something like this. Western civilization has forfeited all semblance of masculinity and all, mas all semblance of truth. If we'd say propositionally that boldness equates in some sense to truth, if the analogy of being is, is true and the transcendentals that Plato talked about are true, that boldness is truth in some sense. All men have forfeited it. So you have Western civilization in the 21st century, which stands for the proposition of both cowardice and falsity. And guys like us who have the truth, and I, I, I think I'd like to think um, boldness on our side as Christian masculinists, we say, no, no, do the true thing. Uh, truth is boldness in some sense. Whereas someone like Tate and a lot of guys, I think a lot of ex-athletes, maybe a lot of uh, black American athletes, think of Cassius Clay, look at the softness of the West over the last 50 years and they say, well, that's false. I want to do the bold thing. Whereas we're looking at Western civilization as it crumbles and we're saying that's that example there in the mainstream is false. We want to do the, the true thing, which contains some portion of boldness. Uh, that seems to be what happens a lot with with young men that would be on the right side is they don't think that you could get uh, all out truth, which is which is a man. It's Christ. Right. The logos. It's a man and it encapsulates boldness. You, they don't think you could get all at once because Christianity has been portrayed softly over the last 50 to 100 years as well. So mm. there seems to be some sort of false equation, uh, false dichotomy, really, between you get to either have the truth or you get to have boldness, which is the way of Islam that Andrew Tate seems to have picked. Right. right. And it's attractive because it, it gives men honor shame these are big things in the masculine psyche and islam is a very obvious manifestation of all of them it's an honor culture ultimately isn't it mm -hmm. yeah very much so mm -hmm. well, i like that we were we talking are, about yeah. boldness and so i like just to relate my experience with regard to religion over you know the past several decades of my life i've been fascinated with religion uh of all types uh <laughs> baptized as a Catholic, but of course fell away. And then started actually making my way back through the Abrahamic faiths. So I learned a little bit about Islam when I was Baha'i many years ago. And so I can I sense the rigor, the discipline, the boldness, the masculinity uh, that is available in that faith, even given that there are those that say it's the fastest growing religion on the planet. It's the, If I'm Tate and I'm addicted to winning, I want to be on a winning team. And it seems like, wow, it, regardless of theology, Islam seems very masculine, very bold, very rigorous, which is something that men want, this whole idea of praying five times a day and fasting for Ramadan, they take very seriously. Mm -hmm. We don't so much in the West. 
And so uh, to want to be associated with that is gratifying to the ego. I want to be on the winning team. I want to be perceived with this boldness and courage and strength and rigor. But I personally had to wrestle with the fact that I am a Catholic Western man. And there must be some virtue in that. There mm. must be some boldness in that. And if you look at the history of our faith, think about St. Peter being crucified upside down. Didn't even ask for that. Think about the martyrs of the faith early on. Of course, Western society has grown soft because of the greatness that Christendom has unfolded. But in this day, to be bold in my mind is to, well, number one, be willing to go back to what got us to where we are and not need to be associated with, how can I put it this way? For me, I like to be an underdog. That's the best way I can say it. That's really what I want to put out there. I want to be the one that's hated. For me, boldness means being Catholic because Catholicism is the only open form of bigotry that's allowed. I think Fulton Sheen said something about, he, had, he wrote a, 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 an article or he gave a speech about if I were not Catholic, he said he would look for the church the world hated. He would look for the church that, that was considered against the times. He would look for the church that uh, was walking with the passion of Christ. And so to me, boldness is not about choosing the winning side or the big bravado, uh, um, um, how you would say, uh, macho, you know, that's the term I like to use, but to choose the, 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 the comeback underdog. It's, it's like Rocky, right? Like Rocky was on top. But what made Rocky great? That he always got smashed down and made his way back up. To me, that's that's the attraction of Catholicism as opposed to Islam. Elliot, it's way. like what, what MJ said in The Last Dance when he was talking in the later episodes about BJ Armstrong once he transferred to the Hornets and they were they were up the year that, that Michael came back from his retirement. They were up on the Bulls in the playoffs and um he, you know, they ended up squeaking out a win or two. And MJ said, well, any man can can talk shit when you're up in points. You talk shit when you're behind or when the score is zero zero. Then you find out what the truth is. And there's there's right. a kind of um, manly truth that that e equation entails that I, I think all of us know. The that would yep. be such a sellout move. As a Western man, I would feel like a sellout if I went the a different route, right? I, I know I'm Catholic, we're all Catholic, and so we have our opinion on Tate's choice. But I'm also interested in speaking about how, or what Will even addressed, which was that now we have more in common. We actually have more in common with this guy. Uh, and not only that, just in terms of Christianity and Islam, I can't help but believe that we get to get together against modernism. Really, I think the conversation is more profitable if we decide what we got in common. That way we can smash the degeneracy of the new world order and the, uh, you know, modernism. That, I, you stole the words out of my mouth, Elliot. That was one of the questions I was going to ask later on. Uh, in fact, in Dearborn, Michigan, last week, uh, Royce White posted this, that Christian and Muslim parents got together. They banded together and, and locked arms to fight against the, the woke transgender nonsense that was coming uh, into the schools. So, yeah, it, it seems like that. I think we can see that happening more and more. Uh, as the the wokeism gets more more intense, uh, so any thoughts on on Elliot's point here about what what uh, uh, an alliance or or common ground might look like in in these worlds? Well, one way of looking at Islam is actually just as a Christian heresy, and that is what Hilaire Belloc uh, suggested in his book on the Great Heresies. I picked out a passage here that I think is important. He says, it was not a pagan contrast with the church. It was not an alien enemy. It was a perversion of Christian doctrine. So he basically says that it is Christianity stripped 
of its specifically Christian content. And then what we're left with is a monotheistic religion that gets quite a lot right by natural law, even though it has no explicit natural law tradition. But it promotes marriage, for example, in a way that gets some things right. Multiple wives means that the kids know who their father is. I mean, this is a big step up from the broken families that the radicals behind the sexual revolution wanted. They're praying five times a day. And some theologians argue that ultimately Christians and Muslims, when they say the word God, refer to the same thing in some sense. So the unmoved <coughs> mover and the various <coughs> kinds of properties that this being has. Christians and Muslims are on the same page in many ways. So why has it got such appeal then? Well, precisely because it's really simplified and streamlined. Berlick says this gives it a vitality. Its vitality and endurance soon gave it the appearance of a new religion. But those who were contemporary with its rise saw it for what it was. Not a denial, but an adaptation and a misuse of the Christian thing. So the example he gives it this, he says that basically Islam takes what is true in it from Catholicism. So any sense in which Tate is now closer to the truth is because he's taken a step closer to Catholicism, having come from the completely pagan world. So the personal nature of God, the fact that God is all good, timeless, the providence of God. These are things that Christians have in common with Muslims. The creative power as the origin of all things. His sustenance of all things by his power alone. We've got good. We've got evil. We've got the fact that after we die, we'll be judged. So there's a massive amount of common ground. Yeah, and even even traditionalists like me, I think, I think uh, all of us are in some senses Catholic traditionalists revere Pope Pius X, who's a, a saint. And in Pius X's catechism, he refers to Islam as uh, uh, the religion of those who affirm the one true God. Vatican II has some documents which refer to the same. And when, when Vatican II documents refer to Muslims in this ecumenical way, that makes everyone feel warm and fuzzy when we can hold hands and note the similarities of religions. Traditionalists like us squint at it suspiciously. But we should remember that it's a simple fact, and, and Pius X calls us to this realization, that the, the Western religions, the three Abrahamic faiths, however errant Islam is, and it's quite errant, it is one of the three out of the 10,000 world religions that affirms one God that comes out of the Abrahamic faith. As much as they, they're probably the furthest away from it, they get that much right. So there's there's plenty to affirm there. Will said it really eloquently. Anything that they affirm that's actually true truth, that comes from Catholicism. Anything that's errant, well, that's a departure from Roman Catholicism. I would just point out that even within the ranks of Christianity, there's a, a, a popular fallacy. My, Mike and I were talking about it this morning before mm -hmm. the show rolled tape. I call it in my, my second book, uh, which is the, the namesake for this show, Rules for Retrogrades. I call it the Miyagi Complex. And the Miyagi Complex goes like this. It, it even transacts within the ranks of Christianity. That anything, because the Western civilization is so bankrupt and the cracks in the walls are so big, Anything Oriental, anything from the East looks inherently different and therefore wise and takes on the form in the popular mind as, uh, you know, venerable, which is which is what Mr. Miyagi was to Daniel's son in Karate Kid, if you think about it. I mean, he was a legitimately good guy. We all love Mr. Miyagi, of course, but but. It's become a complex in the West because when we look to our elders, we say mostly, you know, pale faces because starting with the greatest generation, the baby boomers, the generation X, they have basically nothing to offer, nothing under the hood, no wisdom that they've achieved at the end of their lives. It's all about 
material prosperity and then they're, they're kind of freaked out panicked they don't die happy deaths generationally speaking if i can paint with a broad brush we think old people aren't wise um, that's just because they lost the faith we live in a waspy country to begin with and the catholics here were stricken by modernism and, and they basically lost the faith so you start looking elsewhere. Daniel's son mm -hmm. looks to, to Mr. Miyagi and in the later episodes like Buddhism, he looks to the Far East. It seems wise. It seems old, ancient in the good ways, venerable, trustworthy. It seems like what an older person should be and have. And I think that that's also going on with Andrew Tate turning to Islam rather than Christianity. Mm -hmm. It even happens with Christians, uh, with Catholics who are really disillusioned rightly by this Pope and, and lots of stuff in the church over the last 50 or 65 years since the council. And so they don't want to be too far from home, but they look to Eastern Orthodoxy. It was a very popular, uh, attractive nuisance. That's, I don't know, seems to be taking the West by storm. You either look near East, like Eastern Orthodox Christianity or far East. Uh, or maybe Middle East would be you look Islam, which is what Andrew Tate did. It's an attractive nuisance. Or if you're Daniel's son, you look Far East, you go Buddhism or Hinduism or something like that. Right. Yeah. I, I totally think that could with, me, uh, with every aspect of that. I had Miyagi syndrome for a very, very long time. Uh, I'm a little bit of a weird guy. And, you know, you can call your show retrograde. So this idea of going backwards, I don't think it's so attractive. To a lot of people it's like what's next what's shiny what's the that object that what we, i've got you know is pale comparison to uh how is it that christianity lost its vigor here in the west and what do we have to do to regain it have faith that it will be regained but you know how what does that look like in our day-to-day I think it looks like what we're trying to do here, Elliot, <laughs> yeah. I, sincerely. I mean, I, I don't know that we're the perfect apotheosis or perfect instantiation of it, but it's what we're trying to do. All the guys that I talk to, Elliot, on my channel that have fallen away and are coming back say exactly what Shia LaBeouf said. Dude, they say, I didn't know Jesus was manly because mm -hmm. of the way that he's been lied about by parish women. Well, you know, Susan from the parish council for the last 65 years, yeah. when women took over parish life, they took over the parish schools, they took over the chanceries. It's a really big problem. And you've heard me talk about it before, but they literally said, hey, look, I looked at Christian figures like Jesus's cousin, John the Baptist. I knew he was manly. That's what Shia LaBeouf told Bishop Barron. Remember, mm -hmm. I knew he was manly. I didn't know Jesus was manly until recently. That's mm -hmm. a problem. Because Jesus is the ideal man, is the Virgin Mary is the ideal woman. Um, we've forgotten Jesus is the ideal man. And women, by and large, in society have, have forgotten the latter. Well, once we remember that, Christianity will be attractive as both bold and true, even in the popular mind, once again. So in a nutshell, then, what is it that makes Christ the masculine ideal i'd suggest as a starting point somebody who in the temptation in the wilderness is offered all that the world can give all power all luxury if he will bow down at the feet of the devil that's a specific request the devil makes if falling down you'll worship me and what christ does is stands tall and goes to his death ultimately for the truth so this is someone who's willing to sacrifice himself and put aside all kinds of comfort for the sake of what's right and for the sake of the community at large and that's a masculine role so protecting at the core level what the truth is and the good of the whole community i think that's well said do you think there's a distinction that we can articulate there between that type of self-sacrifice and the, the the Ned Flanders doormat version of Christianity, where it looks 
like it could be a, a version of, of, I don't know, Nietzsche and slave morality or, or uh, self-abnegation? Like what, what's the difference? Nietzsche and slave morality, Mike, doesn't start with the presupposition that the Christian following Jesus could have all the material world at his fingertips, at his behest. Mm. It doesn't, it doesn't begin with that. And I mean, I see this a lot day to day when I tell trad Catholic guys, I'm like, dude, you need to be strong. You need to quit condemning folks, men in the church who have been in fights that have succeeded in the world. You need to quit acting like revenge of the nerds. That's <laughs> Nietzsche's slave morality for those out there who don't know, by the way. Nietzsche has this thing called the slave morality, which instantiates what he calls passive nihilism. It just means revenge of the nerds. If you remember that movie from the 80s where it's like high school nerds grow up and they have a little bit of power, economic power and socioeconomic power in the second place. And they transact continual, they wage continual warfare against the bullies who were cooler than them and got the ladies in high school. It's not just an analogy, guys. If Christians don't start with the assumption, like, yeah, I could win in the world. If I if if that were worth a damn, I could win in the material world. I could be the best at money. I could be the best at athletics. I could be the best at business. That, and, and you know, in, in some ways, maybe, maybe even I was, but I traded that all in because what's not cool is power. Nietzsche said all the world is the will to power and nothing besides. That's just wrong. Uh, what's even cooler, what's even manlier than power is restrained power. As uh, I guess Liam Neeson tries to teach the Nazi in Schindler's List. What's even doper, more muscular than power is restrained power because then you're the power behind the power. That's Jesus. And I, I love I love Will giving that as the paradigm example of why he's so manly. The other reason is kind of the opposite, that he willingly suffered. I mean, it's the other half of that coin. He willingly suffered. He took it like a man for literally billions upon billions of future generations. He suffered willingly. He took it on the chin. That image of restrained strength is really powerfully captured by an image from Chesterton. He says, if you give a weak guy a sledgehammer and an egg and tell him to bring the hammer down onto the egg, there's no way he can stop that hammer. It's going straight onto the egg. You give it to a strong man, he can swing the sledgehammer hard and fast and bring it to a stop just as it touches the shell and the egg's safe. And that's what true strength is, being able to control yourself. You can attack that really effectively, though, with this machismo, macho lie that what a real man does is always exert all the power and control he is capable of over other people. So he'll never say no to sleeping with a woman, for example. It's alpha to have as many baby mamas as possible and to never let anybody tie you down because that would be restraining you. And that's superficially attracted to people because it feels good as well. It feels good to unleash in some superficial way. In terms of the soft Jesus that we have, uh, I want to draw to your attention a video um, with um, Arthur Kwan Lee, who's a friend of mine, he spoke at the 21 convention. He talked about how society is subverted by art. It is always through the arts that the culture is, is changed. Of course, we have painting art, but then we have music, right? We were talking about the rap industry before and how it's a perversion of masculinity and, of course, Hollywood. And um, in, a, in a recent video, I think he was on uh, Alex Jones, actually. He was talking about how Jesus went from now, if you look at an icon of Jesus, an Eastern Orthodox icon or Greek Orthodox icon, he always looks stoic and hard, like the one that I have behind me. Actually, I love this one. You guys can probably see it. Oh, I'm messing things up. Maybe I shouldn't do that. There he goes, right there. I, I like that one where he's got the book. All right, right. right. He just looks he just looks tough. He looks smart. He looks manly. He's got that beard. But then there was a shift, and he started showing all these different uh, 
you know, Jesus with the with the sheep and just looking like a girl now. Now his hair was more like Maybelline or uh, or he put like fancy shampoo in his hair. It's flowing. This guy looks rough. This guy looks like he hasn't taken a shower in, or a bath in months. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we, I think, are living in the uh, the fruits of that, right? Of that subversion that must have happened. Those paintings must have been hundreds of years old. So Christianity started taking on this whitewashing, they call it, this softness, this weakness that, of course, is pervasive now. I, I'm familiar with, I'm lightly familiar, and I'm asking you guys to know more about this, uh, of a movement in, I want to say it was the late 1800s, called muscular Christianity. Are you familiar yes. with this? Oh, yes, Where very much. Jesus were coming out where he's like, you know, rough and rugged bodybuilder and this this idea of rugged manliness that sounds like a it sounds like christian masculinism sounds like what we're trying to do here where did that movement go and maybe is it even alive today i think uh i think world War one and world war two happened and then uh you know that that vitality and virility that you would have found within the the west was uh very much pacified in in a million different ways that's where you start seeing, you know, ag aggressive methods to start um, having uh, uh, co-ed education where you start, uh, you know, bre breaking up the men. The uh, by the way, f first rule of um, warfare is divide and conquer. First rule of uh, counterinsurgency is break up the men, break up the men, give them something to do. When we came into Iraq, split up the men. You guys dig a hole. You guys fill it in. Just keep them busy. You know, so I think large part the the aftermath of World War One and World War Two uh, killed a lot of that that virility. Uh, that that would be my thesis. Uh, what do you guys think? Yeah, it's interesting. I don't know how ubiquitous muscular Christianity was. I mean, it's in some sense it's also associated with like Teddy Roosevelt. Yes. Yeah. And and all that. Uh, I think I think a lot of that had. I mean, it was good. It was good. I'm with you. But it had a Protestant energy. Mm -hmm. And I also think the, the world wars uh, sidetrack all the world. But the, the problem was it, at all three major levels of Christianity, Protestant, Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, what was going on under their noses that entire time, really starting with in the early 1800s uh, at a school called Tübingen in Germany, was liberal Protestant theology, which crept into Catholic theology and the Catholic seminaries by, you know, the 1890s, which is why Leo the Thirteenth and Pius the Tenth were writing about this dangerous toxin of modernism, which was getting into all the water. So while there were some nascent attempts to re-energize Christian men at that time, the doctrine was getting poisonous and the doctrine mm. that I, I mean remember i know i pointed this out before but the boneyard of civilizations is women in power i mean the boneyard ultimately of the human condition if we speak etiologically is is you know eve having power over adam that's why we all have to suffer and we sin and we get sick and we die so there's really a saw so I'm, I'm unique among Catholic traditionalists insofar as they see basically at Vatican II, they changed the mass into this fake and gay new thing called the Novus Ordo. And it's really, it's really lame and men don't connect with it at all. It's a, a feminine in some boomer sense, but they think because they changed the mass, all these other toxic fruits have grown on the tree. I, I, I say it goes way before that. They changed the mass because feminism had creeped into the church. So we have the mass because feminism creeped in, not be, we don't, not the other way around. Hmm. Yeah, and, symptom. Yeah. yeah, it's a symptom. Right, right. Do, do you guys know the book? It's by uh, Dr. Leon Podles, and it's called Church Impotent. He basically sets himself the task of trying to explain the feminization of Christianity. Hmm. And he goes way back. He goes back to around 13th century. And he says, look, we've got this medieval women's movement. Uh, male mortality in almost all societies is consistently higher than female, despite the dangers of childbirth. 
But in the high Middle Ages, the ratio of women to men may even have increased. So he says something happens around then. And basically what you get is that society is confronted with a large number of unmarried women who had to support themselves somehow. They weren't living in households headed by men. You can look about this more in Tim's work. Um, but you get a culture that has a feminine character now. So there's a medieval women's movement. And this affects the religion. It bleeds into what Christianity is like. And he starts the feminization of the church around here and says, before then in history, men and women seem to participate in religion about equally. But some point around the 13th century, we get uh, female dominance. Hmm. That's interesting. Cool. Right. right. So I guess the other thing, do you have a point to that's just way far back. That's really far. I mean, that's it's it's interesting. I don't I don't have anything specifically to say to that. There's lots of desiderata, lots of good stuff. Well, happened yeah in between the 13th century and exactly the 18th century. So it it makes me think. I'm I'm just responding. Yeah, go go ahead, Mike. So I'm curious though. Were you saying, Will, that the the population of women increased because of male mortality. So there was an, an imbalance in terms of um, ratio of men to women. Yeah. So the, there's some evidence suggesting in the high middle ages, this is Podles' point, the, the ratio of women to men seems to have gone up. And then the problems he outlined stemming from this as they affect the church, uh, increased uh, female involvement. And he's talking about this, uh, new kind of bridal mysticism as well which becomes very popular and powerful around then so there's an emphasis on a more receptive or feminine way of relating to god this is another one of his arguments and he thinks this isn't as appealing to men as some other forms of spirituality and the feminization of the church gets underway because of that Interesting. So the uh, the other thing I was going to say in in the cultural waters that also might be be dampening down the virility of of the church uh, is just the, this theme of of modern liberalism or, or enlightenment li liberalism. Uh, and I know Will, you've talked about this uh, extensively uh, and, and recently in your writings. Do you think that that plays a, a watering down effect? in terms of uh, Christian men or, or men finding Catholicism to, to, to be masculine in, in nature? Yeah, I think so. Let's just define it really quickly. The, the core of liberalism is autonomy. This idea that somehow you can find your own meaning or your own truth and your life is ultimately about you as an individual rather than your duties to other people. This, just from that alone weakens the bonds of community weakens the family in particular and you can take it to absurd consequences like secular academics have said that a divorce for example is an expression of freedom and it's an act of the liberal imagination and a father who walks out on his family because he's finding his duties too much to bear is somehow expressing himself and living his truth now obviously that's not just absurd but evil that's no genuine kind of freedom at all but what is protestantism in our view as catholics it's basically liberalism in religious form so it's the rebellion against the authority of the papacy and it's saying that you can pretty much just invent your own christian sect and that's why it proliferates you've got what is it twenty five thousand protestant sects and counting now there's probably a new one being invented right now. 39,000. Wow. Right, there we go. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's the consequences of the idea that someone picks up a Bible, they interpret it by themselves, and they find their own meaning. And when someone else comes along and says, hey, bro, look, I, I'm not really sure that Jesus actually was God, but you think he was. We're both right because the Holy Spirit told us we're both right. Um, now we've both got our own sects. 
and that's it times 39,000. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Trust, trust, trust me. I think take it from any of the four of us folks out there watching this. If there's any time where it would be an attractive nuisance, an easy pitfall to become Protestant with regard to the Pope, it would be now. But again, restrained power, the reason I stay put. I actually end up telling a lot of Eastern Orthodox ortho bros online this. They're like, come on over, man. Orthodoxy is basically Catholicism without the Pope. We got bishops that go all the way back to the apostles. We got the seven sacraments. Just like you guys, we have priests. We have antiquity, right? Protestantism doesn't have any of this stuff. But, um, but we just don't have to deal with this pesky Pope. And Pope Francis is a destroyer. It's like, no, boldness is important, but so is obedience. And that's what we're talking about. Restrain, restrain power here. Could I ask you guys a question, though, uh, to bring it back to the – I'm just thinking of the Tate thing. Mm -hmm. Just on the real, do you think there's any way that you go to any of your audiences or talk to any of your friends who don't follow this stuff, like, closely – and you say, okay, what's what's a more macho religion? What's more manly? Islamic Christianity. We'll get laughed out of the room mm -hmm. if we say Christianity. And that, 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 so I think people might turn this episode of, what is this, episode three? The yeah. sea mask on and be like, what a coat. What a hell of a coat. <laughs> right, let's, yeah. Let's listen for a while. I mean, think about Andrew Tate. We know the whole morphology. A year ago or so, he was like, you walk down a street in London or Paris and you'll be killed. You'll have the shit kicked out of you if you say something about not even not even their God, right? Muhammad's not even God, just their lead prophet. Whereas, you know, in the West, art shows, movies, music say the worst, most blasphemous things about Jesus, who is God-man. And we just sit there and take it. That's got a lot to do with why a fighter, a kickboxer like Andrew Tate, is like, no no chance Christianity is more masculine than Islam. This does need to get addressed. The, the, I don't think we need to restrain our power with regard to this. You should, even Pope Francis says, you should punch someone in the nose if they make fun of your mother, the church. I'm like, can we, that's the one thing he's ever said, I've quoted favorably. Can we get back to that? What do you guys say? I, I was just thinking, I mean, back to Elliot's point about, you know, it seems like it's, it's easy for Tate to jump over that side because not only is he working with the momentum of the, that, religion itself but they also have the protection of the, the nanny state on their side so it's like yeah it's, it's really easy to go ahead and do that when you know that the, the both your boys and your your uh your crew and the police and the state are going to get your back meanwhile mm -hmm. if you know as elliot said if a catholic speaks up not only are you you getting um you know uh, non-state pressure, but that the state itself is going to come and 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 mash you down and and arrest you for whatever misgendering somebody or, or hate speech or whatever. So, I mean, I think that's like let's be honest. I think that that's an element of it that it's not so much that Catholics or Christians they're just weak of their own accord, but there there's an entire state apparatus and regime that we're pinned beneath. I guess we're the body of Christ, thus we must suffer the way he did. And his death was humiliation on the cross. I, I think this is a part of carrying the cross. Like we get to look like losers <laughs> I, because Jesus looks like a loser. And so I don't even know if there's a reconciling this because then we're saying Christian, I don't know how else you would say it, but Christian uh, world order, um, 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 uh, which ultimately is God's kingdom, but he even said that we don't fight or or, or give Caesar what's his. We're not. This is not our. This is not our deal. This is not our gig. Um, 
So I'm sitting here listening and, and, and giving especially what Michael just said. And I'm like, okay, so how do we win? Do I have to argue with people more? Like you, you get slapped if you don't see PBH after Muhammad. Is that what Jesus called us to? Is he saying that we're supposed to fight for this kingdom and we're supposed to uh, overcome being beat down and looking like a loser? Or is this, this is the, the passion, the death, and then ultimately the rebirth resurrection of his body the church and so, so maybe maybe our job is just to suffer elliot there's a there's a meaningful distinction though between what we're called to in, in under the auspices of the great commission when we have a demographical majority like after constantine and on the other hand what we're called to do just the automatic uh demographical defeat pre-constantine when we don't have we christians don't have a majority once we actually have a kind of popular sovereignty in our favor we christians look at what we did in the crusades i mean we we kicked their ass in most of the crusades yeah islam and those are those are those are just wars out of the catholic just war tradition those are holy wars yeah. Literally, aside from the Fourth Crusade, where people were getting carried away. So there is a meaningful distinction. We're not pacifists. We're not like Jehovah's Witnesses or whatever. We we do believe in fighting for what's or what's ours when we're in a position where it won't just be suicide, um, which is what it would have been the first three Christian centuries before Constantine. Is, I mean, does that meaningful distinction, does that distinction strike you guys as meaningful? Yeah, I, I dig everything that you're saying right there. And I guess that was Christianity. That was a church at its, at its best, at its finest hour. And so we must be getting close to the end because this is, this is not that hour right now. And it doesn't look like it's going to rebound in any uh, earthly bound way. It could only be by grace. Yeah, yeah. But, but also the, the, the resurrection is the central fact of Christianity. And there's been many times throughout history, as Chesterton points out, where all has seemed on the verge of being lost. And mm. yet here we still are. And the church has been reborn many times. Tim pointing out there about the Crusades. There were people thinking in the Battle of Lepanto or at the gates of Vienna, this was it. Mm -hmm. Christendom's going down, and then we get these crushing victories over the massed armies of Islam, and the church carries on. So there's precedent for far greater confrontations than anything immediately facing us right now being met and ultimately defeated. So people should take a kind of confidence from what's happened mm -hmm. in history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. that's well said. So I guess I see that, or at least I remember with Rep Lepanto, that Our Lady was present, and it was the prayer, the recitation, recitation of the Rosary, that is said to have allowed that victory to happen uh, in a t in a time where I guess all Christians, maybe I think the Protestants it was after Protestantism, but anyway, most Christians I think were Catholics. They were all Catholic at that time, and so. Even in our time, even our days today, right? Like, so with Our Lady of Fatima, she comes again and she says, well, this is the, this is the way you're going to win again, is with the rosary. And so I'm just thinking out loud in terms of like, okay, what will it look like when this thing turns around? And I think a, a re, a re approach to veneration to Mary in the Protestants is... Is, is a part of what that's going to look like. If we're going to be praying the rosary, it's got to be all of us praying the rosary. And that means Protestants must remember who their mother is. <laughs> remember the mother of God. And so I, I'm just, again, just thinking that that probably has something to do with it. I also just, as this is coming into, I'm in a stream of thought, um, in terms of Muslims having more in common with Catholics than even Protestants, from what I understand, Mary is highly considered and venerated in a way in the Islamic faith. And so I think we got to slap the Protestants and get them to start praying a rosary before we're going to see any change. Yeah, right. Our Lady of Zatun, in, uh, outside of Cairo, 
is an ongoing operation that that took place for over three years on the top of a very 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 cool church that became a, a mosque um the church where they actually think the holy family stayed our lady of zatoon look it up it's responsible for the conversion of according to a couple websites i've looked at over a million muslims to christianity they do have a special reverence for mary there's a great book i have somewhere on my shelves over here it's called tribes with flags and it's all about afghanistan mike i don't know if you know that book but no a journalist who is a fallen away catholic he is held hostage by some muslims for seven months or something they kept fashioning little rosaries out of just the lint in his pocket and they kept destroying them but um <laughs> The Virgin Mary appealed to this secular left Jarno and told him how to escape from the building. And he got out. And he's like a solid Catholic now. And he says the same thing. He said when he tells the story, a lot of Muslims are very interested in the Virgin Mary. The book's called Tribes with Flags. It's, it's very cool because he was a secular left Jarno who like made fun of his childhood faith. And then he came back to it by the Virgin Mary appearing to him. Nice, nice. Yeah, I think that 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 to me, plus what you mentioned, Tim, the uh, a return to, to the TLM, I think, strikes me intuitively as as two of the two of the most easy wins that we we have on our side that we can really lean into. Um, and I think there's a real appetite for it, you know, especially with you know the the Gen Z generation growing up going like what what on earth have we been born into where you know the 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 elders and the generations ahead of us have been sleeping at the wheel and uh yeah so it's it seems like there's a a, a huge and growing appetite for a, a return to tradition and to the TLM and to the rosary and to to a, a, a virile masculine aesthetic with respect to Catholicism as well. If you look at something like a uh, TFP, the tradition family property guys, you know, that has a very stark masculine aesthetic that they, they have, you know, with the bagpipes and the, um, the uh, uh, flags and stuff that they have. So, you know, hope, yeah, hopefully we're starting to see these things coming together. Um, I think we are. Yeah. Yeah. So if, so I, I, I'm thinking this as, as I was putting these notes together. If I'm I'm some despondent incel or MGTOW, you know, jaded Western kid in his mid twenties, and I, you know, I was following Tate, I was I was enrolled in uh, Hustle Hustle Versity or Hustle Academy or whatever you had, and and now my my. Uh, red pill savior has gone Islam. And now I'm, I'm like, okay, wait a second. W where am I? Where am I on the map? What do, what do I do? What's our, what's our pitch? What's our selling point to that guy right now? You know, to, to say, look, th this, this is the one true faith. This is, this is what real masculinity and, and rightly ordered masculinity looks like. It's not red pill. It's, it's not Islam. It's this, what, what's our, what's our message there? I would start by actually flipping that a bit and saying, what is the selling point of Islam to people like Tate and people who look up to him? Mm. And I think Aquinas nailed it in his remarks about Islam when he said that Muhammad seduced the people by promises of carnal pleasure mm. to which the concupiscence of the flesh urges us. His teaching also contained precepts that were in conformity with his promises and he gave free reign to carnal pleasure. In this, as is not unexpected, he was obeyed by carnal men. So people finding this attractive, and we've seen this phenomenon of young guys seeing some terrorists with machine guns, thinking, that looks cool. I'd quite like to be in a war band, and mm -hmm. what I, I'm going to get multiple girls all to myself if I go and join. This is great. This looks like a really easy on-ramp for me. I can pitch mm. this sinking ship of the West, and then there I am in a gang of warlords, and I've got my own private harem. Okay. Yeah. So that's the that's attraction. So cool. Yeah, that's the attraction. <laughs> but, but 
<laughs> what kind of society does that really produce? Is that the way of strength ultimately? No. If you look at the results of any society that's tried multiple wives, they always fall far short of monogamy, even in terms of just basic reproduction. Monogamous societies outbreed polygamous ones because women aren't built for that by nature. It suppresses their fertility. So I think actually, if you go down the Islam route, then you've got far more in common with the destructive people who are pushing the sexual revolution on the West to weaken men. Then you, if you go with Catholicism, which is one man, one woman, strong families, and we've seen what that can produce in the past, and it can do it again. Mm -hmm. Also, now my answer would be, again, I like what Will said a great deal, but to, to take it down a couple notches from the stratosphere, I, I don't want to trivialize anything we're saying that's a little loftier because that's the real truth we're aspiring to but and i don't want to be too crass here but what i would say to these guys that are like tate went to islam you got the nerdy ned flanders christians that are knocking at my door trying to evangelize me who's our leader now what do we do us red pill guys i would say look christian masculinism without getting into the theology, which we've already covered much today, or the ecclesiology or the soteriology, it's better to have sex with one woman, one very, very good woman, 5,000 times for the rest of your life than 5,000 uh, skanks for the rest of your life who are, who are no good. And your sex life is going to be better. You're going to be happy rather than disliking the people that you're sleeping with, which is very anti-natural law to meet someone that's a stranger that you don't even want to lay next to him in bed after the deed is done. But you're, you're doing the most intimate act, which will risk having uh, uh, procreating children. That's a horrible way of life. It's a disgusting way of life. Whereas one good woman who is attainable it might be tough in the age of post-feminism to find five good women or, or definitely five thousand good women you know that the red pill guys will tell you that that's not what you have to do though all you have to do to attain a lifetime of happiness is find one good woman and for the rest of your life she's yours you're hers that's much more manly. It's much more virile and it's much more attractive than the red pill manifesto of having sex with 5,000 different women who you probably will hate for the rest of your life. I mean, by, by Andrew Tate's own conception, the women that sleep with him, this is why what he says is philosophically incoherent. The women who by definition sleep with him are the ones that he's already said are formulaically low value. That's that's the hilarious thing about what he says. A high value woman is the one that won't just have sex with him. I have a, a high value woman is one to settle down with and you get to have sex with her every night. It's a much better way of life. So <clears throat> if we're asking why one would choose Christianity, Catholicism over Islam, given all of the sensational uh reasons why we should you know someone would want to choose tate's new faith i would have to boil it down to truth and if jesus christ is telling the truth about who he says he is then to choose otherwise would be to go against god the father manifest in flesh through his son jesus christ uh, and given that accepting that truth brings us into his kingdom. And so that's kind of like your calling card or your, your pass to get in as a Christian. You can't be a Christian without believing that Christ is God. That's an ascent. You have to, you have to have faith for that. That doesn't come logically. Islam is very logical. One of the, I think it was Will posted something about, or no, it was uh, Father Nix 
about why so many men choose uh, Islam is because with Islam, what you see is what you get. It's very logical. To believe that God became man, that he came down to us because he loves us so much through a virgin and then walked among us with a flesh suit is crazy. And then that guy's walking around saying, not only am I God, but if you don't eat me, eat my body and drink my flesh, then you are not a part of my kingdom. That's all crazy. And we're crazy or faithful to ascend to that. But the appeal is so big. Mystery. I mean, that's why we call it these mysteries. Mystery. I want a faith that has mystery. I want a faith that requires faith that I ascend to something that doesn't make sense to my mind. That's too simple. I don't know. I'm a complex guy, or maybe I make things more complex than they need to be. But take on something that I don't understand and ascend through faith to accept it means that I'm open to the divine, which is all mystery. I don't want to know everything. I want there to be a sense of awe in my life. That plus our God loves us so much that he not only shouts at us from the clouds and sends down people to slap us called prophets, but he said, you know what? I love these people so much that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come down there and dwell amongst them to show us how it's done. Means that my God as a Christian loves me more. <laughs> has higher has higher uh, ideals for me than a God who's just watching you to make sure you're not doing the bad thing. Yeah. There's so much to accepting Jesus Christ as, as God in the flesh in terms of really, truly experiencing the beauty of created life. Muhammad promises you're going to get the bone a bunch of girls when you go to heaven. But Jesus Christ dignifies all of creation. And so we get to we get to we get to live a better life even when we're not dead. Anyway, so those are just some of the things that come to me in terms of why one would choose Christ. It's crazy. Like Paul said, it's a stumbling block to the Jews and a folly to the rest of the folks. <laughs> He's right. But to me, that just sounds great. And I'd rather be a fool and true than uh, you know, someone who's getting goods and wrong. False. Yeah, that's that's the that, I love what you said, Elliot. But the kicker is the means are mysterious, but the end is utterly logical. And I think Islam is represents an inversion of that proposition. In Christianity, the end is that, as uh, Fulton Sheen said, like light from the sun comes down to the plants to feed them in photosynthesis. The light has to come down to the plants. The plants can't go up to the light and get it, mm. right? There's one world religion in the history of all 10,000 world religions that have ever been including the other two monotheisms, Judaism and Islam, including those two, they're with all of the false polytheisms in this regard. God did not come down to man the way the sunlight has to come down to the plants. All the other world religions, including Judaism, failed because God was unwilling to come down to man. And you, you, you note that, the tremendous love that we have. That's very logical that a religion like Jainism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, or Islam, that it will fail if God remains in his heights where he's at and refuses to come down to man. God took on our form. Jesus came incarnate because we're so lowly that we need that linear uh, correspondence with the Logos, who is truth. So that's very logical if you think about it, that a religion... False religions will have God being way up there and man way down here. Uh, uh, nary the two, uh, nary the twain shall meet. 
it's very logical that that the one true religion is the one in which God comes incarnate. As as odd as the proposition is at first that God was born a little baby. Now, the means of all these transactions, which constitute together one one in in totality, one act of incarnation, they're very mysterious. Islam represents an inversion of that. The end is, well, why would we serve this voluntarist God who can make wrong right and right wrong at a moment's notice? In, in Islam, God can make rape holy or murder holy. Uh, you know, that's what voluntarism is. So the end doesn't make sense, but the means of Islam have a lot more intuitive force than sometimes the means of the daily life, the quotidian life of the Christian. So you're going to have mystery and intuitive value, which are two opposites, at some level of your project as a religion. In Islam, you have the means make a lot of sense because man is not being elevated. So it makes sense. Hey, you know, men want to get chicks. Islam is kind of all about that, which is why it makes a great deal of sense that Andrew Tate, without any great conversive, conversive energy, any transactional change that really happened the way it did for Roosh, who became a Christian. Uh, he, he's the counterpoint. It makes sense. Uh, Christianity is the opposite. The end is very intuitive, but it requires us to, to go through uh, um, conversionary process that, that totally changes us, changes the way we look at women, the way we look at other men, the way we look at God, man. The, the other point is that I'm not actually sure Islam has quite the logical appeal that those remarks make it out to have because there are forced conversions. Muhammad said he'd come by the force of his arms. So it's not like people were bowled over by any logical mm -hmm. or philosophical arguments. It was basically convert or die. And mm -hmm. that's not something that the church advocates for instead we say the existence of god can be proven by natural reason alone and then we've got revelation as well and against that philosophical backdrop you've got to contend with the greatest event in human history which is the incarnation crucifixion resurrection what kind of supernatural proof did muhammad bring with him the resurrection is the central fact of christianity and that's what people have to think about ultimately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right. That yeah, th those are the two two main things that I look to that, that I've always intuited as to why Islam is false. The uh, Will's first point that that the Islamic conception of, of heaven, like it's just base pleasure, right? Like that that's this this we were created, we have we have uh, a will, we have intellect, we have reason, we have this capacity for love and beauty. And, and, and uh, to create beauty, to apprehend beauty, to to do mathematics, to, to think about a, a a a higher order God that is, that is all loving, all powerful, um, all all knowing, and despite all these things, like that, it, it, it's all aiming at just a, a an orgy with seventy two virgins. Like that's that's the telos that we're all aiming to. Like that pot, like that just strikes me as just so. Mm. <laughs> um crude, crude right it's just like it, it can't just that that just can't be what, what we're all ordered to um and then second uh, will's point there that's like it's much of islam historically made its conversions not by the force of of reason uh, or by um revelation but by the sword and that strikes me as uh, like that that can't possibly be like the the, the one true faith can't be doing that. That can't be the reason that people are, are converting. Um, so th those, for me, are the, the two giveaways that one is on the wrong path. If that's, those are motivation. That's the carrot and the stick that's, that's um, you know, uh, deciding your life. You see how concomitant all, all three of your points are with, with what I was trying to say. I probably expressed it badly, but the end of Christianity makes sense that, Man does have this transcendental purpose or telos that, that there's all this complex stuff happening because we are man is literally the rational animal, the, the, the corporeal intelligent being 
So we have these two where we're form and matter. We're drawn to all this higher transcendent beauty and logos. But at the same time, we're drawn to food and drink and copulation. So we're complex, uh, unlike the angels who are far closer to being simpler, like God is utterly simple. So it makes sense the, if we consider the end of our life. Christianity comports with it perfectly. Like, oh, yeah, heaven, our final calling, couldn't just be like, getting ass you know which is essentially what it is in islam that, that, that that's utterly inconsistent with with our our you know hylomorphic nature um but the conversion calls us to doing miss and this is what i think elliot was was pointing up uh eloquently the means of converting involves doing some uh counterintuitive things starving yourself you know it's a on wednesdays and fridays i'm black fasting every day it's a you know but in, in lent i i fast a lot more than they do in ramadan uh in islam but yeah you, you, you know you're supposed to only really be a one woman man uh ideally even before you know before marriage you're not allowed to masturbate I had, I had a law professor who wasn't a christian who was like you guys aren't even allowed to masturbate i'm like no that's think about it Think about the end. In Christianity, like Will says, all of the ends, the final goals, make sense. They're utterly consistent with nature and with natural law. But going about them in our quotidian lives seems counterintuitive. It's really not. It just requires our intellect to be converted first, then our wills to be converted. Then you'll see that that intuitive end is utterly consonant with what to the rest of the world looks wacky, looks utterly counterintuitive. It's not. You just have to go through the conversion first. Mm -hmm. Whereas Islam, um, its end makes no sense. Having a voluntarist God who can make murder good, who can change his mind at a whim. But the means is like, it's kind of like, hey, you can have, you know, at some point in Islam, you can have multiple wives. Heaven is just more like the uh, nookie. Right. Heaven's just nookie time 72. And that's pretty much all it's about. And then it's kind of macho, you know, a, a warlord's way. I mean, that's what that's what Muhammad and his uncle Ali were, were essentially warlords. Um, you know, uh, Muhammad with a nine year old wife, no, <laughs> no less. So um, when you examine the granular detail, Christianity makes a lot more sense, even if the Christian way of life looks wacky to people through all its mm -hmm. mysteries. Right, right. All right. Well, it looks like we're we're sort of rounding out uh, the time. Any any last thoughts uh, that you guys want want to end on that we have we haven't hit in this uh, sort of network of ideas? Maybe we can uh, leave our listeners with a sort of one one last nugget uh, to think about. Well, I'm just fascinated to see how this all unfolds for Tate. I wonder if he's going to repent of his ways and start teaching uh, traditional religious ideas to the men who he's perverted with his promiscuous ideas. That would be, in my opinion, a big win. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I think so. Agreed. Well, I, I would just say to young men out there who are listening, Christianity is the greatest, as Chesterton called it, and the manliest challenge that's ever been thrown out there. Even Gandhi acknowledged this, you know, he said, I've become a Christian the second I ever met a Christian. In other words, he's saying it's such an impossible set of challenges that I've never met any real Christian that follows it perfectly. Well, Christianity calls us to love our enemies. It doesn't mean, doesn't mean we don't sometimes uh, strike them down. The death penalty has been hallowed in the Catholic tradition for 2000 years. Holy wars are a thing, you know, the, the just war tradition comes from medieval uh, uh, Catholic tradition. So it's not wrong to be vindicated. You know, Vini Vidi Vici is actually fine from within the Christian tradition. It just has to, it can't be a, a violent war where you're putting uh, infidels to death at the sword. Even Leo the First said of, of Christians who are forcing Jews to convert, no, you do it through sweetness of preaching. So things are far more nuanced in Christianity, which is why it lacks the appeal to some of the uh, testosterone-riddled young men. 
But when you look at Christianity in any granular detail, it's the manliest, it's the most challenging. And it alone of all the world faiths can speak to both the material side of life. We, do, we are animals. Most of us who aren't going to be priests do long to copulate. That's why you should get one good wife instead of a bunch of skanks. And it can also uh, join that in a unique way to the formal aspect of life. Our goal is to get to heaven. And that's ultimately what our wife helps us to do. We lead our wives and our kids to heaven. They help get us there. No other religion can offer that. So become a become a Christian masculinist today. First, you have to become a Christian if you're not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Tate's taking a step in the right direction because at least Islam is monotheistic. It gets some things right about marriage, but falls short in many ways. And to the extent that it's attractive <laughs> because it is simplified and streamlined, I would say be careful because simplified isn't the same thing as simplistic. And what it really is, is simplistic, as Tim's remarks there outlined. Right, right. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm similarly uh, curious as to where, where this this heads next for Tate. And more broadly, if we see, you know, what sort of what he's representing, if we see within the red pill manosphere MGTOW world, if we start to see a, a more proper conversation between Catholicism and, and uh, Islam and uh, men of those faiths. Uh, you know, and, and seeing if, if these details start getting more articulated and, and, and more uh, more debated, uh, that to me, I think, would be the, the next um, predictable step. You know, um, so I'd be curious to see where where that dialogue heads, and if we start seeing like another Dearborn, Michigan type thing, where uh, these these common common ground can be achieved to to fight the the rainbow monster. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that I think is also probably in the, in the, in the offing. So that, that's uh, mm -hmm. my thoughts on it. All right. Well, thank you very much gentlemen for another great, uh, great episode, great dialogue and conversation about these ideas. Uh, next week, I guess, who, who do we have uh, in the queue to, to lead? It's me. I think. Will. Okay. It's Will. All right, cool. We'll, we'll be leading. Uh, I'll be out of pocket. I'll be in a veterans retreat somewhere in the mountains of Colorado. But uh, wish you guys well for the uh, podcast and uh, be, be with you guys in spirit. Um, but that's uh, that's all we got for now, folks. Uh, so go ahead and check out. Uh, do you guys want to just give a, a quick plug to where people can locate all your stuff real quick? Yo, yeah. Get me on you, YouTube. Nolan knows. And then my sub stack as well for the content that I can't put on YouTube. Right. <laughs> nice. Uh, Elliot Hulse, E double L I O double T H U L S E. If you Google it, you'll probably find me. Yeah, Timothy Gordon. You can go to timothyjgordon.com or you can go find me on YouTube at Rules for Retrogrades. But everyone, tune in for next week's show at uh, Nolan Knows. Awesome. Great. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for tuning in, and uh, catch everybody next week. God bless. Everybody. You got it, fellas. Thank you. Peace. Thank care. you. And broadcast.